Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games. If you're new to this series then I'd recommend checking out the first two episodes to get more of an idea of what it's all about and see a range of games from 1982. If you can't be bothered to do that then in essence this series will see me make my way through the golden years of the Beeb and beyond looking at typing games that were published in the many computing magazines of the era. I'll check out a variety of games and determine whether it was ever actually worth the time it took to type them in. I'll also be taking a look at the programme listings and picking out any interesting articles from each of the publications to give an overview of how the world of home computing was evolving over the years. This is the first of three episodes where I'll be focusing on typing games from 1983. By this point the BBC Micro was well established as one of the most popular computers in Britain, both at home and in schools. Due to its higher price point it was lagging behind Sinclair's ZX Spectrum in sales and would soon face competition from the States with the UK launch of the legendary Commodore 64 early that year. Nevertheless, a high number of games were being published for the machine and the majority of computer magazines gave the Beeb good coverage. In this episode I'll be looking at four magazines, all of which make their debuts in this series and covering the period of January to April. To kick things off this time we have an issue of what would eventually become the longest running games magazine in the world, Computer and Video Games. So here we have the February 1983 issue of Computer and Video Games which cost 75p as you can see in the top left corner there, a very space age looking cover and incidentally if you were to go to Wikipedia and look up Computer and Video Games this is the cover of the magazine that you'd see on the top of the Wikipedia page. So the main thing this front cover is advertising is a free 48 page book of games and that's actually where the game listing that I'm going to be looking at in this episode comes from but let's take a quick skim through the magazine as well and see if there's anything of interest. So there's a nice vibrant contents page there with a rhinoceros, a gorilla and a little girl with some fruit in a basket on it and a spaceman in his cockpit. But let's skip past that and go to the letters page because there's quite an interesting letter on here. As you can see it's given the title BBC is the best OK. So here even before the Commodore 64 was released you can see the beginnings of the arguments about which was the best home computer. This one's comparing the BBC Micro to the Spectrum. And the guy says, Dear Sir, I've just read Alan McCauley's letter in your December issue with disbelief. Has he actually used a BBC Micro? I doubt it very much. For all those Spectrum owners who mistakenly think the Spectrum is better than the BBC Micro, just look at the facts. And then it goes on to give a list of various facts. Not many good points for the Spectrum, and lots of bad points including slow, basic, poor quality sound. And he goes on to say why the BBC Micro is better in all respects on those points. He then goes on to say, note that I haven't mentioned the BBC Micro's built-in assembler, flexible mode system for choosing screen format, the superb extended Microsoft Basic or the brilliant software available. It was Richard K. Lloyd that wrote this letter from the We're All in Merseyside. He says, I hope this letter has finally shown all those Spectrum owners that the BBC Micro is the best home computer in the world. So while I would agree that the BBC Micro is better than Spectrum in my opinion too, I don't think it was necessarily the best home computer in the world and it just amused me that these kind of arguments were going on already in the letters pages of the various magazines. Let's move on to the very next page then, an advert, I'm mostly going to be looking at adverts in this magazine actually, but this is an advert for Vision Store, South London's largest microcomputer centre, and you can see they've got the prices for the various machines, including the Commodore 64, which was in stock by February 1983, and the 64K, which is the only version, was £345 upon release. You've got the Atari 400, which you can get for £199.95 for the 16K version, not including basic, you have to pay extra for a basic cartridge on it. There's various software prices, you've also got the Oric 1 which was retailing at £139.95 and the Sinclair ZX81 which was just 50 quid. But the main reason I picked this advert out compared to all the others, well we'll find that when we zoom in for a moment, because it's the location of this particular place that stuck out to me. It's in Kingston-on-Thames in Surrey and I was in London a few weeks ago and actually stayed in Kingston and when I looked at this map very closely, it's very hard to make out because it's quite grainy, but this vision store is on Eden Street and I actually stayed in a Premier Inn which is roughly here where I'm pointing the mouse now, so I thought that was quite interesting just because it stuck out as I actually recognised this road layout. Of course the store's long gone, replaced by a shopping centre, but it was still an interesting thing to see. So skimming through the pages, there's lots of adverts for computers. You can see the best of British micros on this one. You can see the Jupiter Ace amongst others there. But the next thing I wanted to look at was this advert from Activision for Pitfall. That's quite a nice vibrant advert, I thought. Lots of orange, lots of crocodiles and snakes and things on there. You can see a screenshot as well. So that's very nicely presented. The very next page, there's another advert for an Atari 2600 game. Another Activision game, Mega Mania. Interesting to see that Atari 2600 games were still being heavily advertised as we headed into the era where the video game crash occurred in America. So skipping on to another advert, this is on page 52 and it's the Competition Pro Joystick Precision Game Control. Now this is my favourite joystick of all time I think, certainly from the 8-bit era. But what surprised me about this is just how early it was released. I'd always assumed it was sort of 1986-87 that this came out because a lot of the joysticks in the early era of 8-bit gaming were pretty poor. 
As you can see, it's got outstanding features, super strong nylon and steel construction, two special large video fire buttons for right or left hand control, arcade proven molded leaf switches ensure incredible reliability, and a large one and a quarter inch round knob and a unique tapered shaft provide the ultimate in game player controls. So a nice advert there for the joystick that claims it'll give you more points per game. The final thing I wanted to look at in this magazine, because I do want to get onto the supplement that's got the games listings in, was this advert at the back here on page 112 for a couple of games from Data East Corporation. So these are adverts for arcade games, which I don't think I've ever seen in a computer magazine before. So let's zoom in and take a look at those. So as you can see we've got adverts for a couple of arcade games, one's pretty well known, that's Burger Time, I'm sure most people are familiar with that, but a more obscure one here is Mission X, I don't think I've ever played that one myself, but I'm assuming it's some kind of scrolling shooter, so I thought it was interesting to see adverts for arcade games in a computer magazine, because I think most people just encounter arcade games naturally when they go into the arcades, they wouldn't necessarily go looking for a particular one. But there you go, they were distributed by Eurodeco, Deco meaning Data East Corporation, and they were based in Humberside. So let's move on and look at the supplement that came with this edition of computer and video games, the book of games. You can see the front cover here with a lot of representations of different types of games that may or may not appear in it. We've got footballers, racing cars, tanks, wizards, fighter planes, monkeys, spaceships and a submarine. So we'll move on to the contents page and I'll just zoom in and take a look at the introduction here very quickly. Basically it's saying the computer and video games office is regularly deluged with programs from readers more than enough to keep the magazine full for the next few centuries. So they've brought some of them together in this collection, things that haven't been published in the main pages of computer and video games to give you some post Christmas fun. So if you're waiting to get new games after Christmas and you want to spend a bit of time typing your own games in, that was the point of this little supplement. It does go on to say all the games have been tried and tested and they also tried to keep the program short and sweet with the exception of World Cup. Well that's the game that we're going to be looking at and it says here they thought it was worth giving more space to it's a version of the game first published for the shop in our june issue converted to the bbc micro it proved popular with shop owners so now bbc fans will get a chance to have a crack at the big match there are a number of other BBC Micro games in this supplement as well, including Bomber and also Dodgems, but then you can also see there's lots of games for other different systems, such as the Apple, TRS-80, VIC-20, Atari, and probably a few others as well. But let's now move on to the game listing that I'm going to be looking at, which I've said is World Cup. So it starts on page 70 of this supplement and gives a pretty comprehensive introduction of what you're going to be doing. It's basically saying it's a football management game set in the 1982 World Cup. This introductory text is reproduced in the instructions in the game, so we'll take a look at it more closely then. So I'm now just going to quickly skim through the pages that I've got the listing on, and there are lots of them. You can see there's box outs all over the place with the program listing in. I guess this was to try and fit it in as few pages as possible, but this second page of the listing on page 19 is terrible. You've got this section at the top there, then there's a little section down the side, then it starts up further up again on the right hand side, then drops down to this larger section at the bottom that's in an L shape. And this kind of thing's repeated on the other pages as well. So it's a very hard listing to go through and it is massive it's got eight pages of program listing and the final line number is 8140 so assuming it's using the normal increment of 10 per line and that's got over 800 lines of code to type in it's a monster this one so let's now take a look at some of the listing in more detail but i'm not going to spend too much time on it and i'm going to move back to the start to begin with and zoom in a little bit so you can see it more closely the listing begins with some variable declarations and a load of data statements and here you can see the list of all the teams that are included, including several nations that no longer exist such as Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. And following that there's another selection of data statements that are obviously designed to be used in the in-game commentary. So you've got things like hits the ball too far ahead of, somebody's pass is miscontrolled by, hits a long ball to, collects a pass from, is sent away by, swerves past. So it's going to pick these up and use them in the program to actually give you an in-game commentary. So that goes on for quite a few lines and then eventually you can see at the bottom of this section here it does a CLS and then it asks you to choose your team and enter a number from a list and that's where things start to then move into the proper game program. As you can see at the bottom there it also says you can key in the names of your players so that's quite a neat touch. And then it says here you are manager of whichever team you've chosen your aim is to win the 1982 World Cup so it does the draw to put each team into a group and displays the groups and then after that there's a huge sequence of procedures which is effectively all the gameplay elements strung together so you've got proc continue, proc scout, proc fixture, proc sec stage that's the second stage, proc continue again, proc sec fixed which is the fixtures in the second stage, the semi-final gameplay and then finally of course the procedure for the final itself. So that one line effectively runs the whole game for you but obviously it calls the procedures which make up the rest of this massive listing. 
So moving on to the next page, there's a section here about scouting. You can see it prints some stuff onto the screen again here. Scouts can compile dossiers on four teams, enter four numbers from the following separated by commas. So basically it'll give you a list of all the teams in the competition. You pick which ones you want to scout. We'll see what the impact of that is when we look at the game itself. So moving over to the next two pages and there's a big section here on the left hand side that's dealing with printing out the league tables to the screen. There's lots of stuff going on there such as if there's goal difference as a procedure to deal with swapping the teams around based on goal difference and also a proc swap for swapping them around based on how many points they've got. So then moving on to the following page, this is where some of the gameplay logic is. So we've got here the definition for proc gameplay and within there there's a lot of calculations being done which are obviously deciding what to do in terms of the gameplay, whether one team's on the attack or defending, whether they're crossing, shooting, all based on the formation and tactics that you choose which we'll get onto in a moment. You can see that it prints that the ref blows his whistle to start the game and then it tells you who's got possession and that does swap around as these various calculations are performed. Also then we'll run various procedures based on what it works out. I'm guessing there's a random element to that as well as being based on team skill and tactical decisions that you've made before the game starts. But you can see that it can call proc play ran and also proc ran play, proc move pry, whatever that is, and also proc score chance. So that's probably a scoring chance and probably within that procedure it decides whether you score or not. And there's also proc halting which is almost certainly going to be the half time procedure and then at the end of this game eventually when it's gone through all its processing it will print to the screen nothing else of significance happens during the game and prints the final score. There's also some possibilities here for the later stages of extra time being played and also penalties so you can see some extra commands here for people shooting wide or scores from depending on again some kind of random calculations and based on skill and it would take an age to read through all this code and work out exactly what's being done in terms of the calculations so I'm just not going to bother. What we'll do though is just skim through the rest of the listing just to show a few other little bits and pieces of note. So for example page 22 deals with the code for the tactics so you can see here there's a question here asked what formation shall we play, what shall we do with our corners, what are the defence plans, what are the attack plans and each one of those calls a procedure which then allows you to choose some tactical things on the next page. You can see here there's little options for each procedure for each of the tactics for defence, attack, midfield. You can make the options to tackle hard, mark tightly and find space for example in the midfield one. So you'll enter a choice for your tactics and that will all be used within the game to decide based on what the tactics of the opposition are whether you make progress or not. So just to round things off with this listing let's take a look at the final page and you can see here that we've got the semi-final code here and also the final code further down Def Proc File Madrid 11th of July 1982. As with all the other games it will call Proc Gameplay to actually run the game but it's got some specific stuff that's just for the final and the semi-finals and things like that. So for example in these games extra time might be played so you've got some extra stuff printed on the screen for that scenario. Well that's probably enough at looking at the listing, as you can see there's a lot of calculations being performed and decisions being made based on certain values that you pass into the game for tactical decisions, so let's see how all that gets put into action in the game itself. As with almost all the games we've looked at in this series, the game begins with a load of instructions and these are just a recreation of the text from the magazine. These weren't in the original listing I don't think so someone's taken the time to actually add these in as part of the programme. So it begins with a paragraph that will ring true for almost any football fan over the last 60 or so years. Remember the World Cup? Those heady summer days when England still had it all to play for and everyone was saying that this time the lads could pull it off? Well they didn't quite make it did they? And now there's another four years to wait until the next one. But you can fill in the time by playing this version of the World Cup conflict. So yeah as it says there it's a reissue of one of their most popular programmes originally published in 1982 but this time for BBC owners. And then goes on to give several more pages of information about how to play the game and what you've got to do in terms of choosing tactics and that kind of thing. It says you can manage any of the 24 countries involved in the World Cup but expect to have a more difficult time if you pick El Salvador than if you choose Brazil. So there's obviously some kind of ranking system held within the game to make it more difficult with the lower ranked teams. It then continues to give an overview of how to play the game including entering your team names, publishing the draw for the competition and reminding you that you don't have to finish top of the group in the first stage to get through. And from there on it just gives more information about choosing tactics and the ability to make substitutions and that kind of thing. I think we get the idea so we'll move on to the actual game itself now. And the first thing you get to do is choose which team you want to play. As you can see there's a choice of 24 on the screen there and obviously I chose England. And then you get to type in the names of your players and here you'll find me desperately trying to remember who played for England in 1982. I was only 6 at the time so I can't really remember this tournament particularly well. I think I could remember a couple of the player names but then I just ran out of ideas and ended up just picking England players for more recent times. Once you finish typing the player names you then get to look at the draw for the tournament and as you can see England were placed in group 6 along with Northern Ireland, Poland and Peru. 
after that you can then choose four teams to scout and you can choose either the teams that are in your group to sort of give you a better chance of getting out of the group stage or you can choose some of the teams that you expect to get further in the tournament so you get more information about them if you come to play them. So I took the latter approach because I didn't think my group was particularly tough so I decided to just scout Poland in my group and then choose some of the higher ranked teams such as Brazil and Italy for the other scouting trips. After that the tournament starts you begin to get the results of rounds of games that you're not playing in and after each set of results you're given the option of whether you want to display the league table or not. On this occasion I didn't. Eventually you'll go into your first game and as you can see it was England versus Northern Ireland and you get a short profile on Northern Ireland about how they play in defence attack and midfield. If you've chosen to scout an opponent you get a bit more information and we'll see that later. So the next step is to choose your tactics for your match and you can choose a formation and then pick from a variety of options of how to play in defence, midfield and attack as well as what strategy to employ on corners and free kicks. I am going to speed the footage up a little here because it does take a while to get through all this stuff and particularly when you're in game the commentary is actually quite slow. Before the match starts you do get the option to type in the opposing player names but I couldn't be bothered to do that. So then the game starts and the ref blows his whistle and England have possession to begin with and the match proceeds from there. So once the game starts you get a running commentary which is generated from those data statements at the beginning of the listing and I imagine that's somewhat random and after just 10 minutes of play it looked like my tactics have paid off because England scored. Every time either team scores you've got the opportunity to make a substitution but you can only make one substitution in the game as was the rules of football at that time. The game's entirely text based running in mode 7, there's no graphical elements at all and in fact you can't even see an overview of the game so at any point you can't see what the current score is, who's scored, who's on the pitch or even what time in the game it is. You actually don't know what time it is in the game unless one of the teams scores or it's half time. So I do feel that that's one aspect that could be improved, you could perhaps split the screen in half and have the text commentary running on the bottom half while you've got all those statistics displayed at the top. So England got off to a dream start and we're actually 3-0 up at half time in this game and that's the point where you can decide to make tactical changes but actually on this one I didn't bother because I was doing so well. In the second half though Northern Ireland came back into it and ended up clawing two goals back which made it a bit of a nervous end to the game. Ultimately though England did hold out and it ended up 3-2. Once the game's complete you can see all the results for that particular round of games and then you can view the league tables which I obviously did on this occasion to see how my group was stacking up. You'll notice here a small bug in the game as it doesn't actually display the points that any of the teams have although it does have them ranked in the correct order nonetheless. So next up I was facing Peru and chose my tactics and so forth once again but this one did not go particularly well because it ended up 2-1 to Peru which I think you would say was a massive upset. That then brings us to the final game of the first round, England versus Poland and this was the team that I got the scouting report on so you can see that here. In addition to the details about defence, attack and midfield, you're also told what they do on free kicks and corners and what formation they usually play, giving you more insight for when you choose your own tactics. And also it should be mentioned that on every report you get the details of what results each team has got so far. So once again I chose my tactics and kicked off against Poland and this one went even better than the Northern Ireland game as England managed to get 2-0 up in the first 7 minutes with the game eventually ending 3-0. That secured qualification at the top of the group for the next round with Poland coming in second and the next round if you recall was a bit of a weird one in 1982 because they had a second group stage featuring three teams per group with only the top team going through into the semi-finals. As you can see England were drawing an interesting group with Kuwait and Brazil. Now luckily I'd chosen to scout Brazil earlier and that gave me some more insight into how they play which definitely helped in my match against them which was the first one that came up in this round. So against Brazil I decided to go on the attack right from the start with a 4-3-3 formation and tactics that I believe would be a suitable match for theirs although I'm not entirely sure. I think it would just be trial and error with playing this game to decide whether the tactics we've chosen are actually the right ones or not. Anyway the game kicked off and England got off to a flyer again scoring after just 5 minutes. It stayed that way till half time so at that point I decided to change tactics to a 4-4-2 and also change some of the other plans. Unfortunately that probably wasn't such a good move as Brazil came back in the second half and made it one all, making for a pretty nervous end to the game. Ultimately though it ended up a draw which was a pretty good result. Brazil went on to beat Kuwait 1-0 which meant I had to better that score to get through to the semi-finals. In a back and forth game Kuwait scored first but England managed to come back and the game ended 2-1 which meant England qualified for the semi-finals on goals scored. So my managerial prowess had already managed to take England further than they really did in the 1982 World Cup and the semi-final was against Russia. This one ended up being a bit of a walkover as England won the semi-final 5-1. If only things could be that easy in real life. So on my very first attempt at playing this game I managed to take England to the World Cup final and we faced the old rivals West Germany or just Germany as we know them now. I'll let the commentary finish in the background while I round up my thoughts on this one. 
It's obviously a very cleverly made game. There's lots of random elements to it and also some strategy and tactics involved. Unfortunately, it's quite boring to sit through. Each game takes ages it scrolls through and tells you what's going on and there's not that much interaction. Only at half time can you make any tactical changes along with a substitution if a goal scored. So most of the time you're just sitting and watching and it does get a bit boring and it's not helped by a complete lack of colour or sound in the game. Even just a little bit of crowd noise when you scored a goal would add a little bit more excitement to it. There is however definitely some scope for making a more attractive game out of it. As I suggested, if you split the screen and put the commentary at the bottom but some information at the top such as the score, scorers, location, time and tactical information and add a bit of colour and sound then it would make for a more engaging game. It's clearly got some challenge and replayability but unfortunately sitting through all the matches just made it a little bit too dull for me. I can't imagine I'd ever have typed in those 800 lines anyway but I think if I had I would have been a bit disappointed by this overall. And as you can see, the game predictably ended in disappointment as well, as West Germany beat England 2-0. Oh well, perhaps I'll give it another go in four years' time. Let's move on from that near World Cup glory then, onto the second magazine featured in this episode. We're moving on to March 1983, and the very first issue of the Micro User, which went on to be the most popular of the BBC Micro specific magazines. As you can see here though, it was originally called BBC Micro User. That name I imagine had to be changed when the BBC's legal department got involved, because this magazine doesn't have any official link to the BBC. So what can you say about this very first issue? The cover is absolutely dreadful. I mean, if you're going to launch a magazine and you're going to try and make it stand out from all the other magazines on the newsagent's shelves, is this the way to do it? With a picture of the BBC Micro with a mortarboard and an L plate on it? I don't really think so. So it looks like something was given away with it. So perhaps that's why there's a big empty space at the bottom there. You can see it says free first of a series of handy time-saving crib cards to stick on your BBC Micro. But even taking that area out of the equation, it's a pretty terrible front cover. So other things mentioned on the front cover is that you can play Death Watch and that's the game that we're going to be looking at in more detail in a moment. We can iron out those cassette bugs, build your own games paddle, find out what's good and bad in BBC software and explore with the experts in programmers workshop. So it sounds like there's plenty of interesting stuff in this issue but it's only 52 pages long although it does mention that this is an abridged edition in the top corner there. So it seems like perhaps there was a bigger version of this first issue but maybe it didn't get as wide coverage or it hasn't been scanned for archive.org. Anyway this is good enough for my purposes. So we'll jump inside and I suppose the first thing we should do is take a look at the first ever editorial for the magazine. So let's zoom in. And the editorial says, Welcome to the first issue of BBC Micro User, the new totally independent magazine written for and by enthusiastic users of the BBC Micro. It goes on to say their aim is to provide a thoroughly professional magazine devoted exclusively to developing every aspect of the amazing potential of this exciting microcomputer system. So there's a plea for contributions including ideas, criticism and shared enthusiasm with the address that you can write to them there which is in Stockport and it then goes on to say the contents of the magazine will reflect your interest so be sure to let us know what you'd like to see in these pages. Already on the drawing board are plans for a disassembler, a contour drawing program, a series on machine code that is really aimed at the beginner, several exciting games and a host of other features that will help you make the most of your micro. On the opposite page is a couple of interesting news stories. The first one saying that production of the BBC Micro has now reached 11,000 units a month at the three British plants used by Acorn and this figure is expected to be stepped up considerably when the company starts opening up the European market. And further down the same page is the suggestion that Acorn are also moving to drive sales into the USA. It says Acorn are planning an aggressive drive into the educational market in the USA, cashing in on the tremendous amount of interest expected to be generated by the screening of the BBC's computer series on American television. I'm not sure if that ever happened Happened, but it goes on to say they see no reason why the sales in the United States should not even overtake those in the UK. Well I can tell you a reason Acorn and it's called the Commodore 64. Sorry about that. I think the Beeb did make it over to the States but not in the numbers to make any kind of significant impact as far as I'm aware. So moving on, the next interesting article in this first edition of the Micro User was a do-it-yourself, build-your-own games paddle article. So there's a couple of pages here which I'm not going to cover in any great detail, but you can see some information here about how to build your own games paddle. Here's the details of the BBC Micro's analog port that you can use to plug your controller into. And there's also a couple of short programs to help you test your controller once you've built it. Program 1's on page 30 and if we skip over to the next page there's another longer program here to help you test it as well, along with some basic schematics to help you build the paddle itself. Moving further through the magazine then, there's a few articles that were probably quite interesting at the time, such as this programmer's workshop, which is then followed by lots of details about the BBC Micro's operating system, but I'm not really too interested in those anymore, so let's skip on to the game, which is Death Watch, Game of the Month, as it says in the top right-hand corner there, with a big, what I think is a screenshot, but maybe it's not a screenshot because it looks a little bit more like it's been drawn. 
I'm not quite sure. It kind of looks like the game, which you'll see when I show the game in a couple of minutes, but it doesn't quite look like the game. So these lines here, for example, I don't know how they've been drawn, but it's certainly not a straight line. So it's a little bit of a strange one. Anyway, so let's get on to the game description. Death Watch, play this brilliant arcade game by Brian and Marion Clark, husband and wife team, creating a BBC micro game. So let's zoom in to view this more closely and it says in this program which is for Model B only you're in command of a field gun dug into a hillside fortress. There are many tanks on the plane below you and on the shore more are being disembarked from the landing craft. Helicopter gunships appear from time to time to support the tanks. It then goes on to say that tanks and helicopters will shoot at you. They never miss but the damage that they cause is variable. If you survive the first attack you're given a short breather for repairs up to 33% of the damage before battle recommences. A good score is around 6,000 points and full instructions and a high score table are included in the program it says. It then goes on to give you some hints and tips about tinkering with the program. Quite interesting here it says targets all appear black on the screen but the use of the VDU-19 command allows them to be assigned different logical colours and that facilitates scoring. So somehow the program allocates them a different colour number even though they appear as black and then they use that as a kind of multiplier to multiply by 10 to actually give the score for when you hit the target so that's quite interesting. It also says that further use of the VDU-19 command protects the headings. The sky is in fact divided into two colour numbers, both light blue, and when the shell reaches the edge of the first it recognises the boundary of play which stops the score from exploding. So this seems to be using something new that we've not seen in previous listings. It's using the point command to detect the colour on the screen. And also it says that the code to move the gun barrel left to right was initially written in BASIC. However, during testing it was felt there slowed play, so it was consequently converted to machine code. So we're going to see some machine code in this listing as well, it would appear. As with most of the games we've looked at, there's lots of procedures in use here and it says fine tuning can be seen by the use of the routines PROC FR, PROC PT and PROC MV in the main procedure PROC PLAY, PROC FR fires or moves a shell, PROC PT prints or fires a target and PROC MV moves the barrel of the gun using machine code. Further down it says when play becomes too easy the score required before repair, currently 1500 can be increased at line 620 and there's also a number of random factors used to give the program a different feel each time it's played and these may also be adjusted to suit, although it doesn't actually tell you what they are and as is quite typical with the micro user it doesn't then commence the listing immediately it's on a later page so we're currently on page 26 and the death watch listing doesn't actually start until page 49 so let's now skip over to that and take a look at it so on page 49 the death watch listing starts and it's time to get your magnifying glass out or it would have been back when you had this as a hard copy magazine back in the day because the font size on this is absolutely tiny. The code's printed over three columns and there's one page here and then a second page on page 51 so it's two pages of listing going up to 1590 so roughly 150 lines of code some of which are quite long spreading over multiple lines on the pages. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at some of the code being used for this game. So at the very top the first thing you can see is that it calls PROC AS and that's actually the assembly language or machine code stuff so if we move over onto the right hand side here we can see the def PROC for AS and lots of machine code language here being used that I don't really understand but it's all there if you want to dig into it you could probably work out what it's doing if you've got an understanding of machine code. After initialising the machine code routines we then get back to the more familiar basic calls. So it goes into mode 7 and calls proc title for the instructions, also proc variable to initialise the variables and then goes to mode 2, does proc in it to set the game up along with several variable initialisations there and then it calls proc play which is actually defined immediately below there, def proc play which is basically just a call to a bunch of other procedures which is proc fire, proc fire again, proc move, proc fire again, proc fire again, proc move and so on. You get the idea so it's basically just calling the same procedures over and over again to actually run the game. So a lot of this stuff is things we've seen before but I'll just pick another couple of procedures out that are perhaps of interest. There's def proc fr or proc fire, this is the actual firing of the gun. You can see an in key command there that's testing for whether you press the button to fire. Lots of other stuff going on there and also some sounds being generated so obviously it's going to play a noise when you fire the old bullets and presumably when you hit something you'll get an explosion there. It's also using this move command quite a lot which presumably is moving an object along the screen. This game's got an interesting mixture of sprites but also the graphical drawing commands that we saw in one of the games in the last episode. So moving on at the top of the third column here we've got def proc move so this is the procedure to actually move the gun barrel and as you can see it's a very short procedure just three lines and all it's doing is testing for the keys for the left and right movement and then calling LT or RT and those are the machine code programs written further down here or machine code commands so you can see dot RT there and dot LT along with a bunch of other machine code routines that I'm not sure exactly what they're for but no doubt they're called elsewhere in the code. So let's now move on to the second page of the listing and see if there's anything of interest there. 
something that quite clearly stands out here is the definition for proc title which is obviously printing the instructions on the screen you can see it says there death watch and then a bunch of instructions and perhaps the other most notable procedure on this page is proc init which is defining lots of stuff it's got color definitions here with the vdu and color commands and then it goes on to define lots of sprites actually this is in def proc variable but this is defining lots of sprite characters some of which are combined together because if you look here you've got chr255 plus chr254 so it's obviously creating things on the screen that are made up of more than one character. And finally, just to round things off without going into too much depth, we've got proc done defined at the end here. So that's the end of the game. It displays a scoreboard and if you've got a suitable score, you can enter your name. And once again, like we've seen in the last episode, it's using an array to actually print out the high scores. So we've got TT and also TT string, two arrays there that are printing out the scores and the names in the high score table. So I think that'll do for the game listing, let's now take a look at the game, but before we do, let's just skip to the back page of this first issue of the micro user, because here's another program power advert, if you've been watching the previous editions of this series, you'll have seen other ones of these, I'm showing these as I go along because I do quite like these, this one's an advert for Swoop, which was a Galaxian clone, and they're not even being shy about it here, the new Galaxians, it's here at last, Galaxian style machine code arcade game, so no disguising that whatsoever. This advert also mentions Alien Destroyers which was on the last advert of theirs I looked at and also Chess which I think was also on it as well. It's got some vibrant artwork representing Swoop with the Galaxian style enemies flying down which look like a cross between a bat and a bird and an insect perhaps and a micro power guy at the bottom there firing to try and blast them away. But enough about that let's now get on and look at Death Watch. No surprise here then to see that the game begins with some instructions because we saw those in the listing. Pretty simplistic ones here, it says your mission is to hold the fort as long as possible against the combined forces. Controls are Z to turn the barrel left, X to turn right and return to fire and also you press space at the end of the game. So very simple instructions, they may as well have just said shoot stuff. So the game begins as a pretty nice background drawn on the screen, you can see good use of the BBC's colour palette here, we've got cyan for the sky, blue for the sea, we've got a little beach drawn on there as well and then a large green area which is effectively the land. Your fortress is drawn at the bottom of the screen with some ramparts and also the gun barrels there in red and a variety of enemies then make their way onto the screen including a boat from the far right corner which will drop tanks off at the back of the screen. Tanks will come onto the screen from the left and right hand side and also from the horizon and they'll progress towards you from the top giving somewhat of an illusion of a 3D environment. Occasionally helicopters will appear in the sky as well which is a little bit odd because I would have thought this was supposed to be a World War II set game based on the turret you're controlling but evidently not if the helicopter is involved. So the aim of the game is simply to shoot the enemies as quickly as you can before they shoot you. If they do shoot you then they'll inflict some damage and when your damage reaches 100% it's game over. So as it said in the instructions, you rotate the turret left and right, we're using Z and X, and you can fire at various angles. Basically, you've just got to set the angle correct, fire a bullet or sometimes multiple bullets at an enemy until it's blown up. Control of the turret is pretty well done, it's slightly sluggish, but pretty impressive that you can set it at almost any angle to shoot at a target. When you press fire, what looks like a cannonball goes hurtling towards the enemy, and when you've landed enough shots, it explodes. And the explosion noise and effect is very well done and quite satisfying. When an enemy fires at you, I think the damage it flicks is fairly random. You also get the screen flashing, which is quite an impressive effect as well, considering this is predominantly a basic game. The movement of the enemy vehicles is fairly jerky, but at least there's no flicker, and there's even a little bit of animation as the tanks turn their turrets towards you to fire. One touch I do like that probably wasn't really by design is that when you shoot enemies quite a lot of the time there's some wreckage left behind that's just a good excuse for not removing some of the graphical artifacts from the screen I think but it does result in a quite impressive war torn battlefield look. This game's got quite a good look with a mixture of plotted graphics for the background and sprites for the enemies. As was mentioned in the listing in the magazine it uses logical colours to determine the scoring for which enemies you're hitting so you do get a different score depending on which enemy you destroy. When you reach the target score of 1500 you'll get a temporary respite from the action and your damage is reduced by 33%. After that the action restarts faster and more furious. The game is a bit slow at times and you could say it's fairly repetitive as well but it's a pretty decent arcade style gallery shooter and has the look and style of one of the levels from Beachhead. Overall it's a pretty fun game in short blast and shows some interesting programming techniques and considering the listing is only a couple of pages long I think this was a pretty decent offering for the first issue of the micro user.
Let's move on to the next magazine then and we're moving on to April 1983 and the second issue of the BBC Micro User. And if you thought the cover of the first issue was bad, just look at the state of this one. Strangely, this is the third episode of this series in a row where one of the magazines has had an ape or a monkey on the front of it. But this one's the worst by far because it's quite clearly just a bloke in a gorilla suit with a Cindy doll in his hands. And he's there to promote the game that's featured in this magazine and the one I'm going to be looking at, which is the King Kong game. And you can also see there's some bananas in the BBC Micro, but if you look closely, they've actually programmed the game and created this cover because the game is actually there on the monitor so kudos to them for making their own cover image to represent this game but really it's absolutely terrible the other thing to note in the corner here is it says you can win a year's free software in a great new contest and i'm going to be taking a closer look at that so there's not too much of interest to dwell on in this issue of the magazine but I'm going to go to the news pages first because there's a follow up to the article that was in the first edition of the magazine. As you can see the headline says a quarter million dollar USA launch for BBC Micro. So looking more closely at this article you can see that Acorn Managing Director Chris Curry has been to visit Boston where he's been putting the finishing touches to the launch of the BBC Micro on the American market. It goes on to say that the D-Day for this event was April the 16th because that's when the prestigious public broadcasting system starts screening the BBC's The Computer Program which was seen in the UK the previous this year. It appears that Acorn persuading the American TV chiefs to take the series an expensive undertaking. It's cost them a quarter of a million dollars to do this. I don't know if that was money well spent or not, but Acorn were convinced that it would be because they expect to sell between 60 and 80,000 BBC micros in the United States in the next 12 months. I really don't know if that happened or not. I suspect they sold a few, but I'm not sure they reached the numbers they expected to due to the competition from the likes of the Commodore 64 and the Apple II. Somebody in America liked it though because they said the graphics and colour quality are better than anything we've seen in a personal computer but they did criticise the lack of a disc system as standard because in the States cassette storage was considered archaic even at that point. So this news article finished off by saying the general agreement is that with the development of the BBC Micro the British have stolen the lead from Americans in the field of personal computers. Again, I just really don't think that's how it turned out in the end because the Commodore 64 was so successful in the States. I don't think the Beeb got a look in but if you know different then let me know in the video comments. Now I'm skipping through this issue of the magazine quite quickly just to keep things moving in this episode but I just wanted to point out that the micro user offered their games and other programs from each issue of the magazine on cassette tape so if you couldn't be bothered to type them in you could send off and get a cassette and you can see the first two of those advertised here with Death Watch and King Kong being the standouts on the two of them. You could order them at a cost of £3.25 each or £6 for the pair with post and packing costing a mere 50 pence at that point in time. Personally I'd say you have to be pretty lazy not to type the programs in yourself but I have seen these cassettes in bundles of BBC Micro games on eBay quite frequently so obviously some people were buying them. So as I mentioned I wanted to take a look at this competition which is on page 69 of the magazine where you can win a year's supply of software. This is quite interesting actually for the budding basic program because the idea of the competition is to take the program that's been written here and alter it to work better. At the moment there's a problem when the month of the year has more than five letters in it. So what they're suggesting is that you can change this as much as you want, make it as fancy as you like but you need to send some notes in to explain what you're doing and remember it's got to work for all the months of the year. And I also suggest that you want to add some sound to it there I think by saying could you give us a fanfare or something. The reward for all this effort is that the winner will receive a box of software every month for the next year from Acornsoft, the software division of Acorn Computers. And if we scroll down to the bottom of the page you can see here's what awaits the winner of this month's contest, one new box of software for every month of the next year. And there's also the entry form here where you have to send in a program on a cassette along with a listing and a stamped address envelope for its return. So the interesting point of that is you've got to send a listing in which means if you didn't have a printer you presumably have to write it out by hand. All the same it was a pretty good opportunity for anyone who was clued up on basic to show what they were capable of. And the final thing to look at in this magazine before we look at the games listing is the letters page. As you can see here there's a letter about Death Watch, the game that we've just looked at from the first issue. C. Bavistock of Wantage in Oxen has written in to say they found the game Death Watch very difficult to debug and think it would be helpful if the magazine would follow the example of Personal Software Magazine where they're given a table of variables and a table setting out the program structure. That makes checking much easier and helps the beginner to understand program writing. And they also found the printing of the listing very difficult to read which is something I mentioned and variables such as Q% and at percent are almost indistinguishable and led to a lot of mistakes in typing. And the magazine responded to that by saying many apologies about the faint listings, it won't happen again, well we'll see about that. And they agree that they should certainly try and explain the programs and welcome the comments. So it'll be interesting to see if any of those comments were taken on board on the listing we're about to look at. 
Let's move on to the game for this magazine. As it was displayed on the front cover, it's King Kong, although it has to be said that the image inside is a little bit better than the one on the front cover because we've got a shot from the original black and white King Kong from the 30s there. And also there's a screenshot from the game in the top left corner as well. And you can see that it looks like a pretty decent representation of King Kong. You've got Kong on the top of a skyscraper, some characters on the left and right of the skyscraper and a helicopter, which is not quite in keeping with the original King Kong movie, but we'll give them some artistic license in the game. So the top of the left hand page just gives an overview of the game and that's repeated in the instructions so we'll save that for when we look at the game itself. But on the right hand page it goes into quite a bit of detail about the programme so let's take a closer look at that. Now we'll never really know the truth of this, it could be that they were going to put all this detail in anyway or perhaps this was a reaction to the letter that was sent in about the game in the previous issue. But you can see there's lots of detail about what each procedure in the programme does, what many of the variables do and even what certain sections of code are responsible for. So just to pick a few of the most notable ones out, it says that you can change the variable on line 10, diff 1% to set the difficulty level if you want to make it harder or easier to begin with. It says that lines 1 to 70 initialise everything and draw the scenery, and lines 80 to 160 comprise the main loop of the programme. There's procedures for initialising VDUs and variables, procedures for drawing Kong and the skyscraper on the screen, and also drawing the helicopter, and plenty of information about how the movement of the helicopter is achieved. There's also procedures for firing the machine gun, printing the scoreboard, checking if you've crashed, and also seeing if you've completed all the requirements to move on to the next level. So let's now move on to the code itself and see what we can pick out of interest there. But it has to be noted, one thing they didn't take into consideration from that letter in this issue is making it more easy to read because it's still a very small printed font and this time it's black text on a quite dark grey background so very hard to make things out even if you zoom it in quite closely. So I can certainly imagine there'd be some syntax errors if you type this one in without checking very closely what you were doing. Let's take a look at the listing in more detail and the first thing that stood out to me is the very first line says on error go to 50 and then line 50 is proc instructions. So does that mean that if any error occurs at any point in this program it's just going to reload the instructions? That seems a bit of a strange way of dealing with errors but there we go. So the game initialization takes place here with proc init, proc instructions and then it draws proc scoreboard on the screen, calls proc setup to set up various things and proc fanfare which I presume plays some kind of tune and then it generates the helicopter and then we get into the main game code here or the game loop I should say. So we've got proc throw which is where King Kong throws rocks at the helicopter, proc check which does a lot of things I think we'll get onto that later and there's various calculations being done here one of which triggers proc explosion but this one interested me here if flag equals one then flag equals zero CLS which is clear screen loop equals one and go to 60 which takes us back up to the scoreboard so I think that line is basically indicating when you've completed a level and I'm expecting that flag gets set from zero to one in the procedure that was mentioned earlier which checks whether you met all the requirements to move on to the next stage and then the main program loop here increments that loop counter there and then it does a check saying if loops greater than 14 then it sets loop back to 1 and goes to 90 else it goes to 100 if we go back up to 90 that's the procedure where King Kong's throwing things so obviously what happens is it goes through this cycle 14 times and then King Kong throws something and then it goes through it all again checks various things and then King Kong throws something again so if you wanted to slow down the frequency that he throws stuff I think you could change this number here to a higher value Anyway, moving on, we then got the definition of proc init, which is setting up a load of character sprites. We've seen that before. And after that, it sets up a load of variables here, where sheet equals one, men equals three, score equals zero, and various other things. You can see the difficulty level set there, X and Y coordinates, how many times you've hit Kong initially set to zero, whether you've picked a girl up, I think that is, and also whether the left or right girl has been picked up. And finally, the definition of the array that holds the high scores, and it even goes as far as setting the values in that array. It loops through from zero to nine for the 10 high score values sets them all to a thousand with the name of the scorer being BBC computers to begin with. So skipping past the procedures that draw Kong and the skyscraper you can see the definition for proc heli which is drawing the helicopter on the screen and also got some movement logic in it and then we get onto def proc check which was called by the main procedure and that's got quite a lot of stuff going on. It's checking for various keys being pressed which is obviously dealing with the movement of the helicopter and also the firing and calling procedures such as proc crash check, proc pick up and proc drop to perform various actions within the game. Moving on to the second page of the listing which is a lot easier to read because the background's a lot lighter grey. I'm not going to dwell too much but you can see DefProc scoreboard here which is not the high score table it's actually the score readout on the top of the screen. You can see it's counting the number of hits on Kong, your score, what level you're on and how many lives you've got left. 
You can also see the high score table stuff and also the instructions on the right hand side. I'm not going to dwell on those at all because there's a more interesting procedure I want to check out, which is proc your next sheet, which is checking whether you can move on to the next level. There's a whole range of checks being done here, including whether you've hit Kong 40 times and whether you've picked up the two girls. And if you've done all those things, then there's a whole sequence of variables that it changes, including changing the sheet number, upping the difficulty level, and also resetting all these variables for whether Kong's been hit and whether the two girls have been picked up. And as suspected, at the bottom of this procedure, it sets flat equal to 1 which is what triggers the movement onto the next level in that program loop at the beginning of the listing. The last thing I want to pick out before we look at the game is proc fanfare. As suspected that's quite clearly playing some kind of tune because there's a lot of sound commands there. So let's see how good a job they made of composing the tune by taking a look at the game. First up then we have the instructions and you knew these were coming because you'd seen them in the game listing. Very fetching colour scheme in this game, a mixture of cyan and magenta, always a winning colour combination. And it says that King Kong is really quite simple, all you have to do is rescue the two girls perched on the building, land them on the ground and kill King Kong. Yes, that sounds easy. You kill Kong by hitting him 40 times with the machine guns and if you kill Kong before you've rescued both girls from the building the game ends. The game also ends if you crash into one of the girls. So it sounds like there's plenty that can go wrong in this one. It goes on to say you lose lives if you're hit by a rock which Kong throws from his perch or if you hit the skyscraper and then gives details of how you go about rescuing the girls. It finishes off by describing the controls which are A and Z to move the helicopter up and down, shift to move forwards, space to reverse the helicopter and return to fire the machine gun. They're not the easiest of controls to get to grips with as you'll soon see. So you press a key to start the game and as predicted you're greeted with a small tune which is the first time we've heard any music on any of the games we've seen so far in this series and I was hit with a massive wave of nostalgia because this is also the first game in this series that I actually played when I was a kid so I'm pretty sure this wasn't a game that I typed in but it may have been a game that my dad typed in or it may have been a game that we got on one of the many dodgy discs full of games that we got from various people we knew. I'm not even sure I actually enjoyed playing the game but hearing that tune again certainly brought back some memories. So as it said in the instructions, the first thing you've got to do in this game is pick up the two girls from either side of the Empire State Building and deposit them on the floor. While you're trying to do this, Kong is throwing stones at you trying to destroy your helicopter. And if he does hit you, then there's a pretty impressive explosion accompanied by the appropriate sound effect. If you lose a life, then it's back to the start having to rescue the two girls. And once you've done that, you've got to destroy Kong by getting 40 hits on him with your machine gun without getting taken out by one of the rocks he throws. The best way to do this is to get relatively close to him, fire a machine gun a few times to get a few hits in, then move as he throws a rock towards you. Succeed in getting all 40 hits and Kong's destroyed, the level's completed and another little tune plays, along with the phrase how high can you get, which is definitely a nod to another 8 based game, Donkey Kong. After that you move on to the next level and it gets absolutely rock hard. From this point on, Kong aims his rocks at you with pinpoint accuracy, so you have to keep moving around to avoid them, which is really hard to do. What makes the game particularly difficult is the control mechanism, because instead of having buttons to move left and right, you have a button to move forwards and a button to change direction. When you get close to the edge of the building or are trying to avoid the rocks being thrown, panic sets in and you'll frequently end up forgetting that you have to press a button to change direction before you move. With the sudden increase in difficulty level on the second stage, it all becomes a little bit too much to handle, and it won't be long before the game's over. When you do run out of lives, you'll probably get your name into the high score table, which is nicely implemented, and then it's time for another try, and it won't be long before you get to the second stage again, only to find that it's almost impossible to complete. It's a bit of a shame really, because the idea for the game is quite original, and it's well programmed, with the best sound we've heard in a typing game so far, and nice graphics despite the garish colours, with Kong well drawn and neatly animated. Unfortunately, it's all let down by that insane difficulty level. Tweak that and perhaps you'll have a more playable game, but as it is, it's just way too hard to have any longevity. Let's move on to the final magazine of this episode then, and it's issue number 8 of Home Computing Weekly, covering the 26th of April to the 2nd of May. This is the first time we've looked at this magazine, as you can see it's quite simply presented with a nice blue border, a neat logo at the top, and it has a newspaper style presentation with articles on the front cover. On the box out on the left hand side it says you've got programmes to type in for the VIC-20 and BBC, show reports from London and Hanover, pages of news and software reviews for the Atari, Dragon, VIC-20, Spectrum and BBC, so plenty in this one for BBC micro owners. The big story on the front page of this issue is that Dragon gets US warning, so let's zoom in and take a closer look at this one. So this is a similar story to the one we've seen with the BBC Micro and the other magazines we've looked at in this episode. Dragon Data are planning to launch its big selling computer in America, and they've been warned by a Tandy Bosch you'll be tangling with the big boys. So much like Acorn, Dragon Data are aiming to get into the US market by sending 10,000 Dragon 32s to distributors in America. 
But the response to that from Tandy's John Shirley, Senior Vice President in charge of computer merchandising, was that they'll find it a very difficult and competitive market. He goes on to suggest that you'll have to spend millions in TV advertising and in the previous year $500 million was spent on TV ads by the major companies. Towards the end of the article, Mr Shirley said Dragon would face the might of four big companies, Atari, Radio Shack, Texas Instruments and Commodore. That's four big names to contend with and I think it's probably fair to say they didn't do very well over in the States, just as they didn't do very well here in the UK when it's all said and done. So this magazine only consists of 48 pages being a weekly and I'm not going to delve too deeply into it. I'm just going to quickly skim through and pick a couple of interesting things out. And the first thing I noticed was this, an advert for the Micromite 60, a modem for the Spectrum and ZX81, although it does mention that it'll operate with other home computers as well eventually. So what stood out about this is they say it's the high speed computer phone link you've been waiting for. It transmits and receives at 600 board which they say is twice the speed of most other acoustic modems. Now that roughly equates to 600 bits per second and when you think that modern fibre broadband gives you speeds of up to 10 billion bits per second you can see how far we've come in the last 40 years. What I really love about this advert though is just how the modem looks. This is exactly the picture that comes to mind when you think of an old style modem, probably having seen it in the film War Games which came out this year. So you can see it retail for £39.60 which is a bit random and there's no fuss, no hidden extras and no rental costs. And of course there's an order form in the bottom right hand corner where you can send off your cheque or postal order to get your modem if you wanted one. I've now moved towards the back of the magazine although I'm going to skip back towards the front later on. There's a bunch of software reviews here for games for the VIC-20, Spectrum and Commodore 64. They continue on to the next two pages where there's reviews for games on the Dragon, VIC-20, Commodore 64 and even the Colour Genie. Skipping on a few pages and we get an advert for a familiar company here. They were also featured in the last episode, it's Houston Consultants. They've got a game called Heathrow Air Traffic Control, which doesn't sound particularly exciting. That's for the 16 or 48k Spectrum. And they're also offering top royalties for games for the ZX Spectrum, Dragon or Auric. They'll give your program the professional touch and they'll also offer a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow it seems. And just in case you didn't get the message the first time, there's a happy looking chap there saying Houston gave my program the professional touch. I've now moved back to page 25 for the game listing that I'm going to be focusing on from this magazine but before I do there's an advert I want to take a look at on the opposite page. This is one of the most notorious compilations ever released, the infamous Cascade Cassette 50. So the advert says don't miss this incredible offer, 50 games for 9 95 yes 50 games on cassette for all the following and there's a big list of systems there, the Spectrum, ZX81, the Lynx, the Dragon, the Atari, the VIC-20, the Apple on disc and cassette, the Acorn Atom, the BBC A and B, the Sharp, the Oric One and the New Brain so they did this compilation for everything because it eventually came out for the Commodore 64 and some of the other later systems as well. There's a list of games shown but I don't imagine it was the same games on every version of the compilation for the different systems. What I can say though was that many of these games were not even as good as the typing ones we've been looking at in this series. Let's move on to the games listing then and the title for this is hilarious, Can You and Your Metro Make It Through the Night? Take a trip without leaving your computer, Night Drive, a game for the BBC Micro by Philip Tudor puts you in the driving seat. So the opening paragraph says, imagine you're driving through the Yorkshire Moors in your metro on a crisp Sunday morning. That's your driver's eyes view in this program for the BBC Micro Model B. So for some reason, they've decided that the best car you could be imagining to be driving in this game is the lowly Austin Metro, or British Leyland Metro as I think it was called at that point. BL's Metro, can you handle it at speed and in the dark? And there's a nice picture of the Metro as it was in 1983. Now I actually had a Metro as one of my earliest cars and it wasn't much younger than the one shown here. I think it's absolutely hilarious that they've chosen this car as to be the focus of this game. You could have been driving a Ferrari or a Porsche or some kind of fancy sports car, maybe an E-Type Jaguar, but no, you're driving a Mini Metro through the Yorkshire Moors. So anyway, it goes on to say you must make your journey within 60 seconds controlling your speed and direction. I won't go into more details about that because it's pretty much covered in the instructions when we look at the game. It's got some controls listed there and then it goes into lots of detail about how the program works, breaking it down by line number so you've got remarks, test for escape key press, title, optional instructions, setup screen, start sound, dimension arrays and so on. So it gives you a really detailed overview of how the program works and where to look if you want to make changes to it. It also then goes on to give you details of all the variables that are used in the program and also conversion hints so that if you wanted to try and convert this from BBC Basic to Basic on another computer there's some guidelines on how you might go about doing that. Over the page the listing starts and it's a relatively short one again, it's a page and a half with two columns of listings per page. There's also lots of REM statements in this one so it's very clear what's happening in what part of the program and it's also nicely spaced out with spaces between variable names and commands and things like that. So unlike some of the others we've looked at it's fairly easy to read so you're less likely to make mistakes typing this one in. 
So just to pick a few noteworthy things out of the listing, the first thing I noticed is right at the start here, it dimensions a load of arrays, there's like six arrays called XL, YL, XR, YR and so on. And I think what it's doing here is holding the position of the road or the design, the shape of the road almost in these arrays. And I'll get into why I think that is later on. And from there on it goes into the usual sort of things of displaying the instructions, the initializing variables, that kind of thing. It then gets into the main game logic and you can see it testing for some keys here, A and D are the left and right directions and you've also got some keys down here for accelerate and decelerate. Strangely what it does here is depending on which of those keys you press it sets a variable F to 1, 2 or 3 and then immediately afterwards checks if F is 1 or 2 and then calls proc decelerate or accelerate. Seems a bit excessive that you could have just put the call to the procedure immediately on the line where the key press is tested for but I guess the designer of the program did what they wanted to do at the time. Just above that you can see where it's testing for whether you've crashed so you've got proc test and it then goes if c equals one which is basically checking if you've crashed then it calls proc flash which is the crashing flashing animation and then it goes to another procedure called proc crash to say that you've crashed that's actually over here it sets c back to zero prints you've crashed on the screen and then basically goes to proc end which is the next procedure down which is the end of game routine Another interesting thing it seems to do is as you progress down the road it randomly checks for a number. You can see there there's a call to random 2 so it's either going to be 1 or 2. If it's 1 then it calls proc left which presumably makes the road go left and otherwise it calls proc right to make the road go right. So that does mean you're going to get a slightly different game every time depending on what it evaluates that random number call to. This procedure here, proc screen set, sets up the screen as you'd expect and it's even got a rem statement saying that. You can see a lot of VDU commands there and also plot commands. So once again, as we've seen in some of the previous listings, this game is using graphical plotting commands to draw the screen rather than using sprites by the look of it. At the very bottom of the first page on the right hand side here we've got the procedure definitions for the right and left movement and it actually takes values into these procedures I don't think I've seen before in previous listings that we've looked at and those values are used somewhere in this calculation you can see they're m divided by p those are the two values that are taken in so that's somehow using those values to determine the shape of the road or something like that or how far you're moving across the road I'm not entirely sure because I'm not going through it in too much detail but it looks like that's what it's doing and it also calls proc copy which is right at the end of the listing I'll get to that in a moment. So most of the final page of the listing deals with displaying the titles on the screen and also the instructions. There's also a procedure here called proc time which is dealing with the timer on the screen and also speedo. Again you can see some graphical plotting commands there, draw and gcol and also the use of sines and cosines. So there's definitely something to do with circles going on there. And as I mentioned right at the very end of the listing is proc copy and what that seems to be doing is copying the values from one array into another. So what I think it's doing is storing the position of the road or the sides of the road, storing those in a kind of backup array and then using them to somehow derive the new values that go into the main array which would be XR and XL in this case I think. Proc copy is called all over the place and so is proc update and I think what that's doing is actually updating the screen with the new information for the sides of the road. So it seems to be doing some quite clever stuff, but let's now see how all that code takes shape when we look at the game. This game begins in mode 7 with the title Night Driver and asks you if you want the instructions. We may as well see them. And the instructions are displayed in a variety of colours and say you're driving down a country lane. So what you say? You can't see where you're going. In fact, that's not entirely true. You can see the faint edge. To make things easy, the road is curved and if you go over the edge, splat. That doesn't sound very easy. So then you press space to continue onto the second page of instructions and it shows the controls so you can see it's A and D to turn left and right which is odd because that means there's a gap between those two keys which makes it slightly awkward on the fingers because the S is between the A and the D and for accelerate, maintain speed and decelerate it's K, L and M which are actually different keys than were specified in the listing so somebody's made a decision to actually change those keys when they type the game in. So it's interesting that it's got the options to accelerate, decelerate and maintain speed. So basically when you press accelerate it carries on accelerating until you press the maintain speed key and then the same when you're decelerating it will carry on decelerating until you press the key to maintain the speed. So slightly unusual control scheme but there we go. But let's move on and see the game in action. So to begin with it draws a scoreboard at the top of the screen and then draws the dashboard of your car with a timer and a speedometer on it. The timer ticks down and gives you 60 seconds to get to the end of the journey and the speedometer obviously tells you what speed you're going. The road's then drawn on the screen using a series of plotted lines and after an annoying noise to signify the starting of your engine, you're away. And the idea of the game as I said is you've got 60 seconds to get to your destination. There's absolutely no indication how far away you are from your destination so you've just got to judge it based on going as fast as you possibly can without crashing off the side of the road. And that's easier said than done as you can see here I crashed into the side of the road very quickly on my first attempt. When you do crash you get another noise playing, you're told that you crashed, you're given your score, told whether you beat the high score and you get the opportunity to press space for another go. If you do decide to have another go then it then asks you if you want the instructions again, it does that every time you play the game. It basically restarts the game from the beginning. 
So I had multiple attempts at the game and I never completed it. I always end up crashing off the side of the road or running out of time if I'm not going fast enough. The problem with the game is it's very unresponsive. You'll press a key to accelerate, decelerate or move left and right and it seems to take ages for that key press to register. Unfortunately the game's painfully slow at blowing the road on the screen and you've not really got any idea how fast you're going other than seeing the speedometer. You've got no real indication on the size of the roads that you're actually moving, there's no illusion of speed created by the game, so all you can really do is try and keep an eye on whether the road's bending left or right and try to react accordingly. Graphically it's reasonably impressive with the dashboard looking good and giving you most of the information you need and the drawing of the road rendered cleverly. Aside from the initial engine noise and the beeps when you fail to complete the game, there's no sound. Some driving noise in the background would have been quite good, or even some skidding noise as you get close to the edge to give you some warnings. To be honest though, no matter how aesthetically pleasing the game is, it's just too slow to be any real fun with an abysmal refresh rate and awkward unresponsive controls. There's no doubt it's a neat idea and quite cleverly programmed, but unfortunately I think this one's just a bit too ambitious to be done in basic. It probably needs to be done in machine code to get a decent amount of speed out of it. That's it for this episode of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games and the first set of games from 1983. Once again we've seen an increase in the complexity and ambition of the games being published in the magazines compared to those from 1982. World Cup was a huge listing with logic that makes for a different game every time. Death Watch featured significant use of machine code routines in a basic program and was probably the best of this episode's games, while we also saw the first example of incorporating music into a game with King Kong. Night Drive may not have been much fun, but at least the effort to create a first person 3D-esque racing game in basic was admirable. Overall I'd say the games this time around weren't quite as much fun as in the last episode but they still showcased the variety and originality that could be found with typing listings during this period and some of them offer the potential for tweaking to improve their appeal. If you enjoyed this video then please give it a like and leave a comment with any thoughts you have and check out the pinned comment for links to all the games and magazines covered in this episode. Next time around I'll carry on looking at 1983 with another four games from the pages of the micro user, A and B computing and personal computer world. I hope you'll join me for that and until then stay tuned to this channel for more retro gaming content and if you're not already subscribed to my channel then please do so. Thanks very much for watching and until the next time, bye bye.